I'm excited because in this video, we are going to do our first formal mathematical proof. And I have a kind of straightforward claim. The, the claim is that the sum of an even and an odd integer is in fact an odd integer. Like for example, 2 plus 3, that's an even and an odd, and it adds up to 5, which is another odd. Now, that seems straightforward, but are you 100% convinced that this theorem is true for every possible way you can do it? Every possible way you can add an even to an odd, and more importantly, if I'm a skeptic, could you convince me of that? So this is the point of this video. I'm going to show you the basic scaffolds for how you can do a formal direct proof. How you can get started and how you can complete it. The actual theorem doesn't matter so much, it's just a particular example of the structure of a simple direct proof. And then we're going to go on in this course and we're going to see all kinds of different formal proofs of all kinds of different claims. Okay, so let's get started on actually proving this. The first thing I want to do is that I want to be precise about what we're actually saying here and what my definitions are. And in the previous video, we saw the definition of being even and being odd, and, and there they are. We would say that an integer n was even if there was some other integer k where n was twice k, and we'd say that an integer n was odd if there was some other integer k such that your n was twice k plus 1. So, these are the two major words that are sort of mathy in this particular theorem, and before you even get started proving any theorem, you have to have a precise definition of the concepts that are in that particular theorem. All right, so now let's try to prove this particular claim. Now, the first thing I want to note is this. This claim is written in the form of if p, then q. It says if you have some assumptions, namely you've got an even integer and an odd integer, then you get a conclusion that the sum of those two things is an odd integer. So it's saying if you've got an m and an n that's even and odd, then you add the m and the n and you get an odd. So when I want to do this proof, if it goes if some assumptions, then a conclusion, my proof should follow that basic logic when I'm doing a direct proof. I want to begin with the assumptions, I'm going to go on and follow some process, and then I'm going to end with the conclusion. And so when you read it, everything makes sense. You start with what you're supposed to assume, and you do various manipulations, and you get to what you're trying to conclude. That is how you do a direct proof. So in this case, well, what's my assumption? It's the m is even, and that the n is odd, and that's what I'm going to begin with. So that's going to be my very first line of my proof. Let m be even, and n be odd. All right. Now, the problem right now is that the m being even and the n being odd is still a little bit imprecise, but thankfully we've already defined the precise notion of what it means to be even and odd. To be even, it says that there is some integer k such that m can be written as twice k. And to be odd, it means that there is some other integer k so that n can be written as twice k plus 1. However, because I've got two different numbers here, the m and the n, you get two different k's, I'm going to actually call them k1 and k2. And so when I apply my formal definition, here it is, it says there is an integer k1, and there is another integer k2, and that is what lets you write m as twice k1 and n as twice k2 plus 1. So this is the precise mathematical definitions of being even and odd. Now, why do I care about this? Because now I can plug these into formulas. In particular, the theorem that I have here asks for the sum of these two things. I'm trying to make a claim about the sum of m plus n. So I'm going to take the sum of m plus n, and I'm going to substitute in precisely these definitions. So what do I get? I get m plus n here is twice k1 plus twice k2 plus 1. And then if I do this little bit of manipulation, I can bring a 2 out of the factors. I can say this is twice times k1 plus k2 plus 1. So basically I just applied my definition here to the sum, and then I just did a little bit of algebra to pull a 2 out. Now, why did I do the bit of algebra? What I'm trying to do, where I'm going, is that I want the sum of m plus n to be an odd integer. So I want the sum of m plus n to be written as twice an integer plus 1. Well, it sort of is. It's written as twice something plus 1. The something is k1 plus k2. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and define a third k. I'm going to define a k3, and the k3 is the sum of the k1 and the k2. And, and by the way, since k1 was an integer, 
and k2 is an integer, and the sum of two integers is an integer, k3 is also an integer. Now, why do I like that? Well, what have I done here? I now am in a position to write the definition of the conclusion. That is, I can say that I've got a k3 such that m plus n, the sum of these two things, can be written as twice k3 plus 1. And that's just a different way of saying that m plus n is an odd integer. So that's it. That's the end of my proof, and I can put this little QED box to denote that I'm at the end of my proof. Okay, so let's think about the structure of this. Well, we started at the beginning, we've gone to the end. I am now compelled to believe that indeed, in every scenario, the sum of an even and an odd has to be an odd. And this proof is what convinces me of that particular claim. And the way it worked was that at the beginning and at the end, what do I have? Well, I have the assumption going down to the conclusion. I, I began at the beginning and I ended at the end, so that part was good. And this should always be the first and last line of any proof that you write. Heck, you can even go and write the end of your proof before you do anything in the middle, if you so choose, because you know where you're trying to go to is the conclusion. But then I have the green stuff, and the green, the first green, is the definition of my assumptions, and the final one is the definition of my conclusion. So the, the, the assumption and the conclusion might be written a little bit vaguely, they might use some math terminology, but when I'm making an actual proof, I want to have those ideas expressed clearly with formal definition. And so that's what the green's going to represent. And then the pink stuff in the middle, the pink is my manipulations. In this case, I took a sum, I plugged the definitions in, I factored out the two, I defined this K3. That's sort of the body of the proof. So this basic structure that I have here, it repeats itself in proof after proof after proof, that you're going to have this five-step process, in fact, where you state the assumption, you state the definition of the assumption, you do a bunch of manipulations, you get to the definition of the conclusion, and finally you state the conclusion. Now, the actual definitions change to proof to proof, and the actual assumptions and conclusions change proof to proof, but steps one, two, four, and five are all kind of a bit for free. You can sort of write them down, and if you know what your definitions are, you, you can get most of the structure of the proof. What's the hard part is the manipulation, and that changes is different for every single proof. In this case, we had a relatively simple manipulation, but in some proofs it can be very challenging. Final point about this introduction to proofs. This is for so-called direct proofs. Proofs of the claim where you're saying for every value in some domain, you're saying the p of x's imply the q of x's. And you're starting with your assumption p, and you're going towards your conclusion q. This is a for all style statement. And there's other types of proofs out there. First of all, you might have a different order to how you prove things. For example, you could prove things by contrapositive or contradiction. We're going to learn them later. You can have existential proofs opposed to these sort of for all proofs. But in this case, it's a for all proof because we're saying for every possible m that's even and every possible n that's odd, then your sum is going to be odd as well. So this five-step method for direct proofs I hope will serve you very well, and you're going to have a whole bunch of different types of proofs that are using this basic structure.